Municipal development plan does things like set out your target for infill. How much housing are you going to build in existing zoned areas versus how much are you going to put on the outside? For the astute listener, they will realize we have never hit our infill targets since we have set them. Not even close. (laughs) Not even close. This week, council can't beat the heat on admin decisions. We're going to be talking about plaques, Barnes and Horlack. We'll maybe even talk a bit about waiting pools. We're also going to take a look at some of the big items that are coming up for the rest of this year and the ones we think we might pick up the most steam on next year. Hi, I'm Troy. I'm Mac. And we're Speaking, Speaking Municipally. First, it's good to give a little insight into how the sausage gets made. Mac and I collaborate on Slack basically all week, sending links of interesting stories that we should cover for this week. Early this week on Tuesday, I mentioned this to Mac. Yeah, it's a light week, so there's lots of space to do a looking forward and give the whole podcast room to breathe. And later that day, hmm, this um, bench plaque extermination seems to be picking up a lot of steam. Maybe that'd be interesting to mention. Also, we could even relate it to previous events that show the city is doing stupid stuff without taking it to council, and once council hears about it, they force admin to walk it back. And then on Wednesday, I just sent him a one-line message. It's like the city is trying to get me to talk about their bad optics. So, shocker, that's going to be a topic this week. But first, we'll talk about Heritage Days, and specifically the Transit Heritage Days. Mac, you went both last year and this year. What was your experience? So last year I went, um, must have been on the Sunday because it seems like everybody else went on the Sunday and it was really busy. So we took the bus, we took the train down from 104th Street where we live downtown to the university, hopped on the shuttle to get down to the site. And it was probably about a 45 minute bus ride to get there. And it was really warm and sunny that day. So it was unpleasant. Uh, It took a long time to get into the park. This year, uh, I've got a little one at home. So we didn't want to go when it was sweltering hot. We went on the day when it was kind of rainy and um, we did the same train ride down, bus shuttle over. And the longest wait was the off ramp from Groat Road to Emily Murphy Park Road, uh, which was less than 10 minutes. And it was really smooth to get in there. And that's because they gave the buses a dedicated lane this year. When we went last year, of course, I'm an avid cyclist, as the journal would be want to mention. We cycle to Heritage Days. Last year when we went, when we were cycling down the shared use path on Emily Emily Murphy Park Road, it was look at this, we're in 5% of the space with 90% of the people and look at all the cars over there. Right. And it was it was horrible because you had, the sidewalks were completely packed. We went on the busy day last year, the Sunday, and you just physically couldn't, you couldn't even walk your bike because there was just so many people. I remember that. Even from the bus, we could see all of the people streaming up and down the gate, right? Trying to get in there and they weren't going any faster because there was just so many people. This year with the closure of Emily Murphy Park Road for private vehicles, we just took the lane on our bikes and it was very interesting because there was a dad behind me with his like three kids couldn't have been more than six to eight years old each of them and i don't think they'd ever taken the lane on a downhill stretch before and they were just giddy as they were cycling down and picking up speed that's pretty good did you see a lot of other cyclists when you were there yeah so apparently and uh, jim gibbons the uh, jim gibbon the uh, director of the heritage festival says over the past two years they've quadrupled their uh bike rack infrastructure at heritage days and this year it was full so they've got to double or triple it in the next couple years as well that's their good news story for this week we were successful with heritage days and improving it some of the things this week didn't end up so much in line with our goals for the city the city previously had a program where to remember a loved one you could install their plaque with a small message on a city bench people could come gather and live their memory it's a good program by all accounts the people who had bought into the program you know 10 20 years ago got a letter from the city saying they would need twenty five hundred dollars for the next 10 years to maintain the plaque this wasn't in the initial deal and then every 10 years thereafter in one specific case one uh, person who had done this said no um i don't want this and the city removed the plaque from the bench when they didn't pay and replaced it with this charming ad Looking for a meaningful way to remember your loved ones? Visit edmonton.ca slash benchmark. They literally put like an ad words over the memorial plaque. Needless to say, council wasn't happy about this. The mayor in particular. The mayor in particular. He had some choice words, which was 
out of character for Don Iveson. And there's a real cost. Maintenance is an issue. Mm-hmm. Um, things change. Maybe the way the program was developed in the past didn't account for ongoing maintenance costs, and they want to address that now. But the correct way to do that is, as Councillor Paquette says, let's have a conversation about it and have council give some direction, not send a bill to people that were totally unaware that this was coming down the pipe. And it kind of speaks to public engagement as well, right? If we're going to make this change, fine. Let's talk to people about what it might mean and what it could look like and what are some other options and try to come up with a better solution. So I've been on vacation in Europe for most of the summer. Was it always like this? This past week seems like suddenly admin decided, hey, we haven't been running the city over the summer break and we need to do everything in these three days before council gets back. I think admin just realized you were back in town (laughs) and knew you'd need some content for the podcast. Thanks, admin. One of the uh, city bureaucrats speaking to the journal, mentioned that upkeep costs for benches range from $1,400 to $2,655 per bench every three years. I have no idea what that what that gets us. Because even at the Hazeldean Community League, of which I'm currently the president, we had to buy new benches. So we bought them from the city and we got full concrete picnic tables that are built to last 25 years. Right. They cost us $5,000. Right. So why is the city charging so much more for the upkeep of these benches? That doesn't seem like a reasonable amount to me. That's a good question to explore. Yeah. This wasn't the only issue that council had to walk back. And council did walk this back. Yeah, the mayor said, talk to the city manager and the plaques are staying on for now. They walked back another issue this week. What else came up, Mac? So the other thing was also related to the Heritage Festival. Uh, and this one was about a barn that they had built um, on city land that they leased for a dollar a year. They built it back in 1986. And this is the main facility that the Heritage Festival uses to store all of its equipment and supplies in so that every year when they spring up the festival all around the park, everything's right there and they can do it. They also lease or, or lend it out to other festivals that use the park as well for storage. And the city this week decided that they no longer were allowed to use this barn and they were going to try to kick them out of this barn by August 21st. So all their stuff couldn't go back in there after the festival was done. Um, they offered a Quonset hut, which was leaky and had puddles in it in the pictures that, that I saw. Um, and on top of all this, the city decided they were going to use the barn for their own use, um, citing some kind of safety concern. Yeah, so the justification for kicking Heritage Days out is that the barn wasn't safe because the city maintenance yard is right beside it, so theoretically there's some comings and goings that are dangerous. The city maintenance yard has always been there. Nothing has changed. It's not like they've all of a sudden started doing other things in this maintenance yard that are unsafe. No, the barn was built beside the maintenance yard and everything was a-okay. And built by the Heritage Festival. Then suddenly it's not okay. And now the city said we have, you know, a bigger eye for safety. A greater awareness of safety concerns. Sure. And which maybe they do. And maybe this is just something that, you know, culturally it changed. However... The city's going to use the barn. Right. It's not, this barn is being decommissioned. It's, get out, we want the barn now. Right. And this is one of our premier festivals. This is, we just talked about 345,000 people attended, right? 350,000 people attended. It's a very well-loved, long-running festival in the city. And yet it seems like the city's going out of their way to make it difficult for them to continue to operate. In a festival city. Like, right. This is one of our sort of, graciously accepted mottos in lieu of the much beloved city of champions right may he rest in peace (laughs) (laughs) this is a festival city and iveson he came out today and he was mad usually you don't see iveson the good old dad of edmonton you know taking strong language but his quote was as mayor i'm pissed off i'm not happy and he mentioned that admin needs a kick in the rear end now he did say rear end so still a bit of iveson dad in there but Those are some strong words. And you had other councillors coming and saying the same thing. Like, I believe Cartmel mentioned that we need to have a frank conversation with admin. And Andrew Knack posted a blog about how admin needs to have, you know, service-based leadership. So we need to think about how we're serving the clientele before, you know, we try and lead in a direction. And all of it leads to the question of, what's going on in city administration? Well, I feel like we should point out that 
you know, there's a couple of maybe mental models that are always useful to keep in mind. Occam's razor, right? Um, or the idea that you shouldn't ascribe to malice that which can be sufficiently explained by ignorance, I think, is the is the quote, right? Yes. Or incompetence, maybe. <laughs> you know, I think about an issue, uh, was it earlier this year or late last year, um, the restaurant down in Victoria Park Golf Course, right? You could kind of understand, and if you're a counselor, you hear that administration has made this decision, they've kicked out a, or not renewed the lease of a local um, operator, and they'd like to go with an external one instead, okay, they have some guidelines around costs that they're, they're trying to hit. Maybe there's some other criteria that administration was accounting for. They weren't accounting for the fact that we have a food and ag strategy and other things. But there's a there's a line of thinking there that you can reasonably follow. And maybe you don't agree with the decision, but you can kind of get there. With the barn issue and the plaques, it just doesn't make any sense. Like, I don't understand, and I think where counselors get really frustrated is it's really hard to understand what sequence of steps did the people in administration take to come to that as the decision and the action that they were going to take? This sort of leads to a broader issue because, like you mentioned, this isn't the first time that this has happened, and it won't be the last time. This is a pattern of behavior. Even if we look in the past year, we had city council completely blindsided by the waiting pool issue. Right. The administration decided that based on, again, a safety issue, that they couldn't have the waiting pool as is, and it needed to be reduced to a splashing puddle, as it were. But they didn't alert council or give them the heads up on this, like, it's a premier landmark. Full of people in the summertime. Council did end up siding with administration, as it were, on that issue, but they were completely blindsided by it. And that was the huge issue of last year. It goes into some of the other issues. For those that aren't aware, there's a current policy on the books in the city of Edmonton, city policy C566, that says if 67% of a community supports speed reduction, you can do it. The city will put up the signs and it'll get done. The city, as of yet, has not developed any procedures. So if a community like Hazel Dean and I did, got all the signatures together, they couldn't actually lower their speed limit because the city would say, well, we don't know what to do with this we petition. have no idea how to follow that policy. Yeah, which this policy is six years old. Right. And it came up at a public meeting almost a year ago that this policy has no procedures, it can't be used, and we have no intention of following council's direction in implementing this policy. Leaving aside the fact that administration did their own neighborhood speed reduction pilot, so they actually had some procedures... <laughs> <laughs> Just not aligned with this policy, maybe. It sort of seems like administration is running wild in this city. Council is supposed to be holding administration accountable, but we don't actually seem to see a lot of that. I don't know, if, am I overstepping my bounds here? Are you seeing the same thing that I'm seeing? What I think is really interesting about this is the previous city manager, Simon Farbrother, one of the reasons that they let him go is because he was seen as not having a close enough rein on things. He was off traveling to other places and not paying enough attention, giving that oversight that is really necessary. And when they picked Linda Cochran as the new city manager, she's a long time city employee. She's been there for a very long time. Uh, she kind of knows the ins and outs and knows all of the people involved. And it was kind of a thought that she would have a much tighter handle on the reins. And I'm not saying that she doesn't. Maybe this is all new to her as well and she's got to figure this out, but it certainly seems like there are some decisions being made that haven't had the appropriate oversight. It sort of makes you wonder the reporting structure that even allows these issues to exist. Because like you mentioned, it's sort of baffling to think of the thought process of, I'm going to remove this plaque if these people don't pay the extortion fee of $2,500. Well, the other thing that's interesting right now and some of the discussion we've seen online in response to all of this is the ongoing reorganization that takes place at the city and they've got new departments and you know temporary interim people leading them in some cases and it's not clear who's doing what and which program is now in which branch or which department and that sort of confusion on the ground i think also contributes to this lack of oversight that we're potentially seeing if you looked at the groat road bridge it's under construction for the next two years and currently there's a dismount and walk sign for cyclists which fine whatever side of the issue you're on that's fine. The sign can exist there. Right. But Councillor Knack, for example, said, I don't really agree with this sign being there. I'd like more information on why the sign is there and, you know, what policy was followed to put the sign there and what can be done about it. How did that sign get there in the first place? Exactly. That's all he asked 50 days ago. And as of yet, updates this weekend, Councillor Knack was not able to get an answer from administration on his question of how did this sign get there? 
I'm not sure about you, but unable to get an answer as a city councillor sort of seems like you don't have any control of the city anymore. Like, these are people that report to you. Council sets direction and is the board of directors. What culturally is going on in the interaction between city council and city administration that allows this breakdown to occur? And I think that's what we're going to see in this upcoming week. You have Iveson saying we're going to have frank discussions with administration. Right. I'm suspecting administration's leash is about to get a lot tighter and there's going to be a lot less sort of freedom for decision making. I mean, council at the end of the day has two employees, right? The city manager and the city auditor. And everybody in administration reports up to the city manager. So. And of course, they just renewed the contract for the existing city manager. Right. And that's that's the other key point. Council does hold administration accountable. But really, the only method they have for holding administration accountable is firing the city manager. Right. Which we fired the last one, ran a very expensive global competition to try and find a new one, and ended up hiring someone from within. So that's not a trivial action to just fire a city manager. You can't find a new one very easily. No, it's a serious decision. And as you say, they've just renewed the contract. So it seems very unlikely that that's going to be the action they take. Um, but those sorts of conversations that the mayor talked about, that is something they can do. And even though they don't report directly to council, they can absolutely have conversations with the other senior leaders in administration to uh, share their views on being caught off guard on their summer recess by some of the things that happened. Moving on a little bit, let's look at the bigger picture because council, hard to believe they're still on recess. They're not back just yet. Committee starts next week. So I thought it would be fun. Let's look at the upcoming council season, as it were, and talk about some of the big issues. Now, Mac, excitingly, has... <laughs> What's your biggest issue of oh, the upcoming council season? You know season? what? I love spreadsheets. Uh, one of the key items that's coming up in the fall, of course, is the budget. It's sort of one of the biggest discussions we're going to have in the city because it's really the opportunity for everybody to say, what are we spending our money on and should we be spending our money on those things? So we're about to renew both our capital budget and our operating budget for the next four years. So these are Which is a change from normal. For the operating budget, we've gone from three to four years. The capital budget... Uh, I think was already at four years, potentially. Maybe they're both going from three to four. But anyway, they're aligned now with council terms roughly, right? So four years. So 2019 to 2022 is the is the new structure. Though, interestingly, aligned with council I terms. I meant the length, but, sorry. Yes, offset by two years, yes. which is good. You don't right. want someone to walk in and radically change all priorities. Right. There's still two years to go for the new council that yeah. comes in. Yep. Uh, so that'll start kind of end of October, early November. We'll see the presentations on the budget. There's already been some preliminary stuff presented to council, but those will be the final presentations. And then deliberations and public discussion will happen the last week of November and the first two weeks of December if we need that much time. And I think it's important to pay attention to this because, I mean, it's our, t it's our money. It's taxpayer money at the end of the day. But also I think council has already heard and will continue to hear an increased amount of chatter around holding the line on tax increases. We have this group, Prosperity Edmonton, who is a collection of business associations in the city of Edmonton. We're basically saying, hold the line, no increases on property tax for the next X number of years. And now that's actually quite a big ask because we've got some increases already on the books. There's already increases for LRT, for alley renewal, and for this new police funding formula that council previously agreed on. So there are already some percentage tax increases there. The, what the mayor has said is that holding the line to the, uh, you know, the increase in tax to whatever inflation is, is maybe a more reasonable ask. Mm -hmm. But a 0% increase is just not going to happen. There's even other big things coming up. A little more grandiose than budget. Vision 2050, as an example, is something that's coming up. What else is on your sort of radar there? So Vision 2050 was just approved by council in June, and the draft strategic plan, so the next 10 years, was also uh, just, the draft was just approved, so not the final thing yet. But council has given some direction to administration to continue with this planning process that is now underway. So we kind of have like a 10-year cycle of these major plans in Edmonton. You're supposed to have, as a municipality, a uh, master development plan and a transportation master plan. Uh, so MDP, TMP is what people call them if you ever hear the acronyms. Uh, our, our current ones were in effect from 2009 to 2018. So we're at the end of that cycle. We're now looking at some new 
updated plans. And they do things like the, the master plan does things like set out, um, sorry, it's municipal development plan. That's what I meant to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and transportation master plan. The municipal development plan does things like set out your target for infill. How much housing are you going to build in existing zoned areas versus how much are you going to put on the outside? For the astute listener, they will realize we have never hit our infill targets since we have set them. Not even close. (laughs) Not even close. Some other interesting things come out of the municipal development plan. So last time there was this big discussion around food and egg in the Northeast, land in the Northeast. And so we had this new food and egg strategy. How should we grow? We have these urban growth areas. These are pockets of the city that have been kind of intended to be used for future development um but you know that's a land speculators game so should we always develop those or not so there's growth coordination strategy you know it's a big big document lots of high level stuff in it but it does have an impact on the day-to-day same with the transportation master plan high level document but that's where we say we want to shift our transportation modes we want to have less people driving in their vehicles from place to place and more people walking or cycling or taking the bus or transit the real difficulty with these master plans especially with the public consultation pieces a counselor has to be accountable for you know following their constituents' wishes when they're developing these master plans. But it's very hard to grok as an individual these sort of grandiose visions for 2050. You know, say, I want that bus by my house to come a little bit more frequently, not, you know, I want a 17% mode share of transit in my neighborhood. And that sort of communications exercise is what makes this such a difficult conversation. And it'll be interesting to see, especially with quite a few new counselors on council this term, some of whom are um, pulling back on some of our visions for Edmonton. We'll have to see how that conversation goes. That'll be interesting to watch. The other difference this time versus last time is I feel like there, maybe this isn't totally accurate, but my perception of it is that there are more things already ongoing, like the transit strategy and the the revamp of the bus routes and things like that, that you know, are sort of feed in pieces to a TMP. And so it'll be interesting to see how those things impact the development of these bigger plans. You know, last time we had the way ahead, that's what we called it, our big 10 year strategy. There was the MDP, the TMP, there was one about finance and, you know, all these other environment, um, all these different topics. Uh, This year, council has decided they're going to simplify their strategic view and their goals and things like that. And they're just going to say that their vision is Edmonton is a connected city. It's really simple. One line. Edmonton is a connected city. Something to that effect. So that'll be really interesting to see as well. If they try to simplify the whole thing overall, the way ahead ended up getting a bit sprawling uh, when all was said and done. (laughs) On brand. (laughs) The other advantage of a simplified document is it makes it easier for perhaps someone in administration who doesn't understand guiding principles of the city to look at a document and say, hmm. In Should theory. I remove this plaque based on <laughs> Vision 2050? In theory. <laughs> In theory. Those are some of the big issues that will affect our city as a growth and as we develop. But there's also going to be perhaps the more sexy side of it, which is the taxi driver taking his shirt off, the big snafus at City Hall, the news-grabbing headlines. And you and I both agreed that this is probably going to be one of the bigger debates of next year, which is the composting, recycling, and separating organics. In the city of Edmonton, we've long since touted our prowess as a recycling city. We had world-class recycling facilities that we were targeting 90% diversion from landfill. Nowhere even close. We even thought for a time that we could sell our great processes and systems to other places. We are failing Pretty critically, our composting facility doesn't have a roof, so is out of commission right now. Naturally, we looked at the best practices around the world and said, look, our blue bag of everything in one bag and we'll deal with it later. That's not working out and that's not selling our recyclables to the global economy. So what do most jurisdictions do? They have separated bags. You've got a bag for organics, bag for recyclables, tin cans, paper, all that sort of thing leads to a whole host of issues like for example do you allow grass clippings and yard waste in the garbage or do you make people bring that in right do you have bins in front of your house for automated pickup these are all issues that have a lot of contention and will be coming to debate next year do you have any thoughts about how this is going to go well for me personally i've actually flipped on this so Uh, previously I was a big fan of the idea that we would utilize economies of scale. We'd have one great, big, fantastic, technologically advanced waste management center. We'd send everything there and it would separate everything for us. 
have nice recyclables and compost and all the rest of it. And where I've flipped is that on two things. One, as you pointed out, we're less than 50%. So we're not even close to where we wanted to be. So clearly it's not working. So it's kind of doesn't make any sense to continue to support that. The second thing, actually, though, I think is really interesting, um, especially in our kitchens, we throw out a lot of food. There's an awful lot of food waste. Um, most of the waste in residences is around uh, is around food waste. And the idea that you throw everything in one bag and somebody else figures it out later sounds good. Um, but in reality, if you want to change people's behavior, having them separated out at the source in their homes, having a green box or a green bag separate from your garbage, I think would actually lead to a bigger behavioral change. Uh, and if that's what we're really looking to see in the city of Edmonton, then that's probably the way to go. And it's probably why St. Albert and lots of other places have followed that model already. If you even look globally, the city of Taipei is one of the best cities for recycling. And they actually have a truck with a bunch of different bins and it's got a chime on it. And every time when it drives by in the evening, people go with their bins and they put each of their pieces of garbage in the appropriate recycling bin. Right. It's sort of like a community thing. And that's why it'll be an interesting debate because Mm -hmm. people haven't done it that way for years. So they're used to their one bag system or two, right? Garbage and blue bag. Now you're going to tell them they have to do it a different way. People are resistant to change. Well, and even we've had a lot of confusion because most jurisdictions in the world say you cannot put a pizza box in the recycling. Right. Edmonton is very steadfast. You absolutely do put a pizza box in the recycling. Except we probably shouldn't have been doing that because it's been contaminating our recycling. And we're not getting to that waste diverted from landfill like we wanted to. The other one that's sort of a take it or leave it, but culturally huge, is one that's near and dear to my heart. We've mentioned it earlier on the program. It's residential speed limits. Now, this came up this year. Uh, I was one of the people that spoke at council, hoping beyond all hope that we would get a speed reduction in the city. Right. Council instead decided to kick the can one year further. That's going to be coming up this year. Uh, They probably can't kick the can again because that's bad optics, but Don Iveson, in the current debate this year, said he kicked the can because the votes weren't there. He didn't think if it was called to a vote that he could get speeds reduced in the city of Edmonton. This is always such a huge divisive issue, and in Alberta specifically, we have this weird speeding culture. You mentioned something earlier that... As quick as we can go... Wherever we want to go, whenever we want to get there. That's kind of the belief. That tends to break down in urban centers, as we've seen across the world. Uh, But without sort of presupposing my listeners' opinions on this, this is going to be a huge issue in terms of just the expanse of debate. Because people have opinions about speed limits, and a speed reduction would be a vote against constituents' wishes. Cars are very personal for people Mm -hmm. in, in Edmonton and Alberta, and... I do think there's going to be a lot of passion on the debate. You have very passionate people in favor of reducing speed limits. They make very good arguments about safety. And if we're serious about Vision Zero and actually trying to achieve those targets, this is a really key thing that we can do to get there. There's passionate people on the other side who don't want to give up a few extra minutes in their commute or see it as an attack on them just because they're a driver, just because of the lifestyle choice that they've made. They work somewhere farther away from where they live. They need to drive to get there. That's fine. That's a fine decision. Um, but that's the way we, we've always sort of subsidized that type of thing in the, in the city before. And if now council says, nope, we're going to reduce your speed limits, it's seen as like a bit of a personal attack on their way of living. Yeah. Right. Well, I personally am a sergeant general in the war on cars. So... <laughs> So I, I said also earlier that I think, you know, in the city, we've kind of taken two steps back, forward, one steps back, two steps forward, one step back. I do think we'll get there with lower speed limits. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but I think we'll get there eventually. And one idea to soften the blow when council makes this happen, I think we increase the speed on the white mud at the exact same time. Everyone will be so happy about the increased speed on the white mud. They won't notice all of the residential speeds that have been dropped. Interesting you should mention that. Uh, That was Councillor Knack's sort of go at it last time the residential speed limit came up. And he said, look, we'll lower it on local roads and increase it on these particular collectors. The unfortunate issue is when he did that, everyone came out of the woodworks and said, well, actually right here, that's super dangerous because there's a seniors crossing right there. There's so many exceptions to the rule. Right. So in council next week, actually, at committee next week, uh, there's a couple of interesting reports coming up. 
related to this very issue. So one is some progress on defining what a collector road is, what an arterial road is, all of those sorts of things, because part of that debate led to this discussion about, well, what is a collector road and what should be considered one or not? Um, the other thing that's interesting is we have these 406 playground areas where we did reduce the speed limit to 30 kilometers an hour. Council's now... Re- playground zones. Oh, zones, sorry. Playground zones, yes. Um, administration has now reviewed that and they've identified a number of them that actually don't meet the criteria and will revert back to 50 kilometers per hour. We will cover this several times over the coming year, I'm sure. Some honorable mentions, quick rapid fire, things that will come up this year, but we don't want to talk about because either they bore us or we are sick of talking about gondolas. Gondolas are one of the things that will be coming up as a big issue in the upcoming year. We're probably going to see a lot about Terwilliger Drive, which is woefully not servicing the southwest of Edmonton. Bike share and bike grids, of course, bike lanes will always be a thorn in the side of every counselor. It doesn't matter which side they're on. You want to get someone to go and talk to them about bike lanes. As is known. I think that's going to wrap it up for our first episode. I hope everyone enjoyed. This has been Speaking Municipally, the first episode. If you like what you hear, please give us a subscription in iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Pocket Casts, Stitcher, Spotify. Wherever you get your podcasts. Wherever podcasts are sold, we're sold there free of charge. If you really like what you heard, give us a rating and review on iTunes. It really helps to boost that exposure and help keep the show going. Uh, Speaking Municipally is produced by Taproot Edmonton. And Mac, what's Taproot Edmonton? We are a journalism startup in Edmonton that is trying to tell curiosity-based stories about our city. So we look to our members and our audience to help us decide what are the important things that we should be covering. And then we go and do stories on those things so that it's very aligned with people's interests and with things that are going to impact them on a day-to-day. So we're always interested in feedback. If something we've talked about tonight was particularly useful, we'd love to hear that. If you think there's ways that we can improve this podcast and make it more useful for you, we'd love to hear that as well. There's a lot to cover in municipal politics, which brings to one of the things that Taproot Edmonton is actually doing starting this week. Right. So Taproot Edmonton does what we call roundups. These are every week we'll gather all of the information on a particular topic, try to make some sense of it for you and send it to you via email. So you've got that roundup. So you don't have to go and search for all that information on your own. We are going to start doing this with council as well. So starting the same day as you're going to hear this podcast, uh, we're launching the council roundup, which will be a look at what is council decided on in the past week and what is coming up in the week ahead. Uh, so we go through the agenda so you don't have to. The council roundup won't be our sterling and wonderful editorializing opinions. It'll be the recap of what you need. If you want to hear why you should care or how you should vote, that's where you tune in. Absolutely. Um, but that's that's going to wrap it up for our first week. We did it. It's 33 degrees in this room. Um, it was a bad idea to record <laughs> up here, but darn it if we didn't do it anyway. Good job, Don. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Troy. I'm Mac. And we're Speaking, Speaking Municipally. Municipally.